Okay, and we are now recording for the July 5th, 2023 ECAC meeting. Um, and tonight we're going to start with our um, nomination and votes for a new ECAC chair. So I guess we will begin with first asking if anyone would like to nominate someone or themselves. You, if you want to raise your hand electronically or or physically, you can raise your hand and let me know if you want to nominate yourself or someone else. <laughs> can I just ask a point of clarification? Yes. Um, is it my understanding that Lori is currently our co-chair or uh, vice, uh, assistant vice chair? chair? Vice, vice chair. chair. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to nominate Laurie Goldner. I second that nomination. And okay. All right. Um, I'm not so opposed to it, but I'm also happy to have somebody else do it. So just for the heck of it, I'll nominate Dwayne. <laughs> Dwayne, how do you feel about this nomination? <laughs> uh, appreciative, uh, Lori. Um, um, I think I will, if I'm able, <laughs> Stephanie, um, decline such a nomination given my responsibilities on on uh, the solar bylaw working group uh, at the moment, which is about all I can handle in terms of meeting preps and so forth. That makes sense. Laura? Um, he might say no, but I would like to nominate Steve. I will second that uh, before Steve has anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, are you open to that nomination? Um, no, I don't think I would have the time to do the job properly. Okay. Anybody else wanting to self-nominate? the nomination. I would, I would then um, offer a nomination of Jesse. Um, um, and um, see what he has to say. <laughs> um, I, I would also feel like I couldn't do a good job. Um, I've given my other and somewhat unpredictable time constraints that I'm gonna that I see in the next couple of years. Okay. All right, I would like see. to point out that we will also be needing a vice chair because yeah, so that that'll come after we do with the chair yeah. that yeah. that election is <laughs> next. So we have to get through this one first. <laughs> so, um, okay. So let's see. Um, so so far, the only nomination we have uh, right now that's on the table is for um, Lori, and Jesse has seconded that nomination. So as there are no other individuals interested or willing to serve in that role, then I would ask that if you could give me via voice vote, um, your vote for Goldner as the new chair of the ECAC. Somebody rescue me, please. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in no particular order, Bregger? Yes. Oh, or, yeah. Am I saying yes or am I saying Lori? <laughs> Okay. You're, well, this is I. I specifically identified Lori. Okay. So, um, so yes. Okay. Roof. Yes. Drucker. Yes. Selman. Yes. Goldner. I guess I will say yes since I'm willing. Okay. And Rose. Yes. Congratulations, Lori. You are now the new chair of the ECAC. Um, so the next hard to Wonderful. come close to what Vasu put together, especially toward the end here. So I'm a uh, report is impressive. Well, everybody does Don't something a best. little different and brings their own styles. So you have plenty of things to bring, I'm sure. So um, <laughs> we'll we'll be happy to to support whatever you bring to the table too. Um, Thank you all. And I, I wanted to say too that we're going to need someone to take the minutes. Um, so that will be maybe your first point of order, and then you want to go into the vote for the vice chair, nominations, and vote for the vice chair. 
Okay, so who's I'm going? already started because I am definitely oh great okay. definitely overdue. So okay, thanks, Laura. Okay, thank you, Laura. Appreciate that. Okay, so we need nominations for a vice chair. I can say that as vice chair this year, I didn't do a whole lot. I mostly just sort of tried to keep track of what Jesse was up to and occasionally stepped in, but it wasn't a big lift. It would be nice to have somebody who might be interested in continuing as chair though next year. Mm. Not necessary, but nice. Succession is always important. Uh, I nominate Jesse Selman. I would second that. If I'm allowed to, as chair. I will accept that nomination with, based on your advertisement of it being a limited lift. And we'll, as vice chair, of course, always encourage you not to overlift as chair. OK. And do we have another um, nomination of another individual or a self-nomination? Okay, so um, with that, I'll ask for everyone to give me their vote via voice vote for Jesse to serve as the vice chair of the ECAC. Rose? Yes. Ruth? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Goldner? Yes. Breger? Yes. Selman? Yes. Congratulations. Okay, so with that, um, <clears throat> I think we need to review and vote on the minutes from the last um, meeting. Uh, Stephanie, if you want to throw them up uh, on shared screen, that might be nice. But I did read through them and have no corrections, but I wasn't here. So I should probably abstain from the vote. Are there any corrections or comments or? Andra? Um, it the notes that Basu would be submitting the annual report, and I believe that that was not quite this intention since it wasn't done when he left. Just so well, clarify. I think at the time that was the case, because he was saying he would submit the annual report in July, but um, it didn't, it wasn't ready. So I don't think it meant that he had to. I think that at the time that was what the plan was. So I don't think we'd want to change that because that was what we were going to do. But then, well, by the, by the end of the meeting, we knew that it wasn't done quite. So um, I, I think we did know that it, and it, we probably should have said the chair will submit it. All right. And probably not. Well, it, it's not clear to me from the discussion that went back and forth whether the uh, we're talking about a July submission or a September submission at this point. Well, I think this the September was the presentation, not okay. the submission. OK. So the chair is fine. I, I, you know, I. I will leave that for you guys to decide, but I think the chair covers Vasu or me or whoever needs to do it. So, so fair enough. Edit. Chair or former chair. We, we can leave the notes as they are, but just as long as that's highlighted in our minds. Okay. So no change then? Okay, no, it looks like no change since it sounds like that was actually said during the meeting and it's an accurate recording. Um, other comments? If not, then I think we have to vote on accepting the minutes. I move to accept the minutes. I second. Okay, and then no, I'm going to stop sharing. So give me one second here. Um, in no particular order um, to approve the minutes. Goldner? I will abstain since I wasn't here. Okay. Uh, Breger? 
Yes. Selman? Yes. Drucker? Abstain. Roof? Yes. Rose? Yes. Minutes are approved. Okay, it looks like we have five attendees. So the next order of business is public comments. Uh, if you are an attendee and would like to say something, raise your hand electronically. And Stephanie will let you into the meeting to speak. So it doesn't look like there are any questions or comments at this time. Okay, so no questions or comments at this time. We'll come back to that again at the end. Uh, we're into item four, which is updates. So Don is not here. So I think we have to put that off another week. Is anyone else aware of any updates for PACE? There was a flyer and then it got put aside waiting for meetings. I think that's still sort of on hold. So what happened is that they're um, updating the program. And so we were waiting on right. information and we haven't gotten anything yet. So uh, as far as we know, the updates haven't happened. So um, it's not for lack of Don doing anything. It's just that we don't have the information we need. Hmm. It's sort of in hold. So it's on hold. Um, and updates on the solar projects, the solar bylaw working group and projects, Dwayne. Uh, yep, uh, we continue to meet obviously uh, every other week. We're meeting again on Friday. Uh, we did um, have the opportunity to have um, the GIS uh, coordinator for the town. What's his, sorry, what's his position um, or information? Uh, he's, he's the uh, GIS specialist. G GIS specialist. Um, for the town review with us, uh, the work that he's done in coordination with the GZA solar assessment mapping. Um, and basically this is now available uh, publicly um, that basically provides the outcomes of the GZA um, feasibility, if you will, uh, and uh, ranking of sites across the town on a 30 by 30 foot square basis um, in terms of solar feasibility across various different uh, attributes. Uh, and then the ability, importantly, the ability then to overlay, and this is what um, the G GIS specialist uh, was able to render in the overlay of various other layers of interest uh, to allow for uh, the bylaw working group for ECAC and for the public uh, to then look at um, solar siting in in uh, in the town uh, with regard to general feasibility uh, and then uh, overlaid with such things as um, land cover, uh, soil types, um, uh, 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 the parcels themselves. Um, uh, whether it's forest or agriculture, uh, a uh, land that's in rest in restriction, in various different forms, conservation land, wetlands, uh, and so forth, uh, to get a sense of uh, of where uh, solar siting might be uh, best targeted. Um, importantly, uh, it's not this whole process is not a process of solar that uh, of solar development. Uh, we don't have the tools, we don't have the information, we don't have the expertise, and we don't have the uh, the need particularly to look at uh, at sites, um, in, in, uh, and it's not meant to be a parcel by parcel analysis. Um, most of this is obviously uh, private property, um, uh, but it gives um, a, a good sense of where opportunities around Amherst uh, might be best uh, both in terms of uh, within the built environment and the unbuilt environment. So that's available um, for uh, us to look at. Um, we do not have access to the GIS specialist for the town 
uh, to walk through that with us as, as an ECAC group uh, because he's not really um, available this time of the day. Um, so that's that. Um, we are, um, well, let me ask, uh, pause if there's any questions on that. And then there's a couple other things. Yeah, Jesse. I mean, is it possible to, for, to post on the website, maybe it's there, but the, what the rankings mean, the, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? The one, the the one through uh, ten, I think it is, um, ranking for the solar for the solar feasibility. Yeah, which are, you know, so they've you know, there's eight nine, which is purple. There's this that. Is there any way to understand? Give. Because, well, that, yeah. yeah, is that? I mean, it's a that... it, it's a formula that's based on I think four attributes associated with the site, uh, including such things as distance from utility lines, um, slope. Um, um and a few other things uh and 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 of course this was all areas of town that weren't wiped out by other layers that made it yeah impossible. i watched i watched the video yeah okay so I, that that given a test drive to the whole thing and it's yeah but i didn't maybe well, I that's it, not I didn't it's see. not in the map but there is a, there is a separate report that gza provided correct stephanie that's posted yeah, that, I, that was that sent to everybody. Okay, yeah, I think it has it in there, but I can resend it to yeah. everybody if you'd like. It has the criteria and the weighting of the criteria. Uh, That's and super helpful because yeah. and as you fly, there's, you know, knowing a lot of those locations, I was like, huh, why is that one better than that one? And I thought if I had the criteria. Well, exactly. And um, there is this tendency to look at, at where you live or your your friends live or whatever to see, you know, uh, importantly, I would say that, um, yeah, and things can change like from from one one thirty by 30 square to another can change. And there's a reason for that, but it could be because of um, uh, of a change in the slope that we're not aware of there. If you see some kind of a border. Of of a lot of changing that tends to be maybe because you certain there's a certain threshold of distance from the utility line or distribution line. I, so, I am, yeah the grand I mean I understand it. it's it's very it's very fun interesting to look through I understand that it's yes it's, it's conceptual it's like yes. enough to get you out there and start talking and thinking about projects it's not they're not solar panels but yeah yeah but okay yeah I'll I'll dig into the GZA report to get those um yeah yeah uh ranking so that, i think that'd be helpful to sort of clarify thank you yeah. yeah yeah and if anyone hasn't looked at this i just shared it it's really quite detailed and you can zoom in and see the individual buildings and where the things are how different areas are ranked and it would be nice to i agree it would be nice to have the uh scores defined um anyway, i'll stop sharing i assume everyone's looked at this unless there's yeah, would um what we don't have access to is to to uh you know go to any one of those 30 by 30 squares and get the exact um uh scoring for each of the attributes for that square it's just the it's just the cumulative right. formulaic uh result of uh, of all the attributes in that in that particular 30 by 30 square right um, in addition to that, uh, go ahead, uh, Steve. Well, I was going to ask if we could have a discussion about this map as something separate from your SBWG update. Yeah, I think that was the intent uh, okay. that ECAC would be interested in this. Uh, again, we don't, we, we unlike the working group, we don't, we just don't have access to the GIS specialist uh, to walk us through it. Um, that being said, um, I think I could do a decent justice and with Stephanie um, if we wanted to dedicate some time to it um, on on, a, uh, on an upcoming agenda. Yeah, I'd like that. I have some questions that I can raise a little bit later in the meeting and um, some concerns as well about some things, but it's separate from your update, so I'll hold off on that. So this is for a future meeting then to put on? Well, the I think I'd like to raise them a little bit later. I can do that during my update later in the meeting yeah. but i think but, yes if we could schedule a time at one of our future meetings to discuss okay. the map the the methods any questions that members might have um that would be that would be very nice for us to do yeah okay 
So I'm putting that uh, for a future yep. agenda. Yep. Uh, Steph Stephanie. Yeah, I was just going to say it's in the minutes already for a future agenda item because Steve made this request at the last meeting for okay. agenda items for future meetings. So it's in the minutes. So I'm just saying it's already captured, but this is just to back up that request. So, and Dwayne, can you give that presentation or do we need to bring someone else in to give the presentation? It sounded like you could do it. Um, I probably can't do it with the justice that um, the GIS specialist would, but, but but we don't have access to him. So um, I think um, well, could myself bring him, with Stephanie. Could, could we bring him in or no? He's not available okay. at the time of our meetings. Yeah. Okay. So um, the, the solar bylaw working group meeting is earlier in the day. Um, we could, if you really wanted, we could consider um, having a special meeting earlier in the day that would be an additional meeting. I would recommend watching the movie that Stephanie sent out, giving it a test drive. And I would be surprised if you if folks still had kind of technical questions about how to navigate. It's pretty user friendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know that we need to take his time or change our time. Um, that's my initial read on the situation. Steve, can I assume that you've already watched that movie and that these questions are outside of that? I That's correct. Yeah, they're less to do about the interface and more about the, um, a, a bit about the methodology that GZA used and, and then something more about discussion. How are we, ECAC, going to use these results to come to some useful conclusions and recommendations? Okay, so in that case, it sounds like it might be worth having a special earlier meeting with the GIS specialist. I no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, okay. I think the questions we're going to have are are not about not not questions that he will be able to answer. Okay, gotcha. Right. If, if right. we have questions about how to navigate or what the layers mean, then I suppose we could send him a question and he could reply through Stephanie. I don't think we need him in person to help us navigate the website. Okay. Yeah. The the, the one thing I would suggest, uh, and and I haven't looked at what additional layers he's added rec more recently, but one of the issues that came up was, you know, there's a lot of, you know, quite feasible looking solar um, in terms of the color coding that happens to be in the more built environment. Um, and, and, um, and that's useful information, uh, but it's not to suggest the, uh, you know, but, but those, those, those particular sites, when you start getting down into small parcel sizes, uh, which are generally residential, uh, then, you know, the, the capacity for solar on those parcels um, are relatively, may be relatively small uh, in terms of, of the rooftop that happens to be there, uh, though in some cases people might put this in their front or backyards, but, um, but generally it's the rooftop. So it's not, it's not, you can't necessarily look at the map and say, oh, there's this swath of uh, of um, nice feasible solar uh, and we can just, you know, lay it out there because that may happen to be the downtown <laughs> core of, uh, of, of yeah. our residential um, and, and residential areas. Uh, so right. it, it's, it, you need to sort of look at it with that lens as well. Right. Uh, Steve. I, I guess that gets to the heart of one of my questions, and that's in the GZA report, they noted that they did in their decision to use a 30 foot square grid, they noted that that provided three times as much solar capacity than if they had done the analysis on a parcel by parcel basis, um, which seems to me to be a very big spread of results based on a somewhat arbitrary decision, the 30 by 30 grid. So I, I don't know if this is a question, Dwayne, that you can answer, but did, did, if they change the grid size, how much does this total acreage of each feasibility score change? Now, if you want the 50 by 50 foot grid rather than 30 by 30, how does that change the, the final results? Dwayne, I can jump in with the, unless you want to answer that. Well, I was going to answer that it's kind of a hypothetical because we don't really have access to them to do that. I know. Um, uh, but uh, um, and maybe that's what Stephanie was going to say. No, I was going to say that when we were deciding on the, 
you know, how to actually develop the grid. Um, Cause we, when we were gonna look at a parcel by parcel, the problem is that depending on if you had some kind of priority habitat or estimated habitat, it might identify the whole parcel as being off limits, which wouldn't necessarily be the case because you can have estimated habitat, habitat on a parcel um, and have a structure that could support solar on it. So we were trying, that's why we started to sort of look at different sizes. The 30 by 30 was the size, the smallest size that we could come up with that would give us the most detailed information. So that was sort of like a, it's an economy of scale kind of thing. Like what, how small can you go and how big can you go? That seemed to be the most feasible um, size for the analysis and which is why they came up with that. So, um, you know, in going from parcel to grid, there was sort of the, the sort of big discussion about, do we want to go by parcels? And the reason I gave you is why we decided not to. In terms of the size of the, of the grid that we came up with, 30 by 30 was the most detailed that they could come to that was reasonable for them to actually compute the data and come up with some kind of calculations and analysis. Okay, so I yeah I can I can understand that rationale. I think what it does is it gives sort of a very maximal value for the amount of land available for solar in those different uh, feasibility categories, and that's something that has to be kept in mind and probably needs to be highlighted that if that it's a maximum value based on a very small grid size, and nobody builds a solar panel. Well, not at least a larger one, thirty by thirty. And I'd say most of the regulations dealing with solar are on a parcel basis. Um, so it tends to overestimate the amount of land available for solar. So that, that's one of my concerns. And Duane had raised that a bit at the Solar Bylaw Working Group meeting, asking if the town, if Mike could aggregate some of those and sort of create a map with a larger footprint um, and I think he said that, yeah, he could do that. That would be easy to do. And I forget, what did you say, Dwayne, like a two acre size? Well, I, I asked him to basically, yeah, exactly. To, to uh, Might have even, even been an acre uh, was to um, be able to sort of uh, parse out what, what was the fees, what was the fees. And this was particularly for the bylaw working group. And maybe it was two acres because the bylaw working group is particularly focused on ground larger scale ground mounted solar uh right. in terms of uh, well i think the threshold's 200 or 250 kilowatts scale so that's uh probably a couple acres um and so uh with some buffer and so forth so i think yeah maybe it was two acres so is really to look at okay and given that that has to be on a specific parcel uh then um we did i did ask him to see if you could do a, an additional layer to sort of parse out where is that fee, where is the where does that feasible solar uh, get laid out if it if it's constrained by being on a parcel that's more than two acres and again that was really specific to ground mounted solar right the idea was that we were capturing rooftop solar potential as well which is partly why we were going so small because we yes, needed I, to look at rooftop as well yeah so yeah, I agree. if you're looking at the rooftop or small smaller units in residential parcels, then this approach, the 30 square foot approach can work. Um, but that that's different, doesn't quite work as well if you're looking at the, the larger ground mount that the Solar Bylaw Working Group is charged to look at. Um, I, let me ask this other question that I have, if it, and that has to do with on the parcel basis. And you might know this one, Duane, um, as far as I understand, under the SMART program, if any parcel is more than 50% core habitat or priority habitat or critical natural landscape, then the whole parcel is not eligible for SMART incentives. Is, that's, that's what I've read in the, in the laws, in the or summaries of the laws, at least, that an entire parcel is ineligible for the SMART program if 50% or more of the area is core habitat, priority habitat, and critical natural landscapes. Um, but that's not represented here in the GZA map since it's not aware of parcels. So it seems like there's an awful lot more space that's protected, not available for solar, if that law is or that regulation is really um, 
well, if my understanding of that regulation is correct. Did, so is that regulation correct? Is that a hard, fast regulation or are there ways developers can get around it? Um, I'd have to verify that um, myself. Okay. Um, that being said, um, if it is a fa hard and fast rule, at least, at least what we tried, I think, for, for uh, GZA was to wipe that those parcels off the map to begin with. Um, uh, in terms of those those uh, those parcels, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephanie. All the estimated habitat was removed. Right. So it doesn't mean the entire parcel was blocked off. It just means the estimated habitat was removed. Okay. okay. But they were well aware of the guidelines and the SMART program when they were developing the layers. Well, I remember, and I did ask that, and their answer was, well, the SMART regulations might change. And so that was their justification for not eliminating a parcel if it was more than 50% one of the protected categories. And I would argue that that's not, not a good approach because just like the SMART regulations could change, so could APR regulations or so could other things. So I think without that, recognize it without it recognizing those restrictions on the smart program we're we're mapping up the map shows a lot of areas that are probably not eligible due to that that particular restriction i think i just want to jump in with clarification too that this map was never ever intended to be like this is where solar can go all of this is doing is identifying the feasibility with certain guidelines for the potential for solar development. And what we've been saying all along is that any project that goes, that gets proposed, it's kind of a place to start, but every project next to, needs to go through its own permitting process review. It has to, you know, have site review before it could move forward. So, I mean, it, it, again, it's just really a tool to identify feasibility, but it's not absolute feasibility. It's never been ever um, been identified as like this is hard and fast where solar exactly where solar can go. Yeah, that that's that, that that's true. Every every project would have a site review. But my concern is that this overestimates for those the two reasons that I've raised overestimates mm -hmm. the total amount of area in town that's available for solar. And so when Solar Bylaw Working Group looks at it, they'll say, oh, there's plenty of space for solar in town. And that's not correct for two reasons. One, because they don't pay attention to this smart regulation that eliminates parcels that are 50% protected habitat. And because of the small grid size sort of maximizing it. So it will lead to misinterpretation and it might lead to solar by our working group saying, oh, we can restrict a lot of forests because we have a lot of solar potential in town, which I don't think is accurate. So those are the two concerns that I have that might lead this map to be, to be um, misleading i think it's funny i just it's funny because i've heard from some others that the perspective is that it's not a lot of and i'm not saying everybody in the working group but some people have said oh it's not a lot it's not as much as we thought because if you look at the most likely feasible it's really tiny like the most highly feasible oh, yeah. is very very small so i think you know it's a matter of you know, perspective, and I think they're going to have to work that through anyway. Those are. I'd, I'd really like to get clarification on this smart regulation, and and if indeed a parcel, an entire parcel, is ineligible for smart incentives, if it's fifty percent or more protected habitat, then I think that needs to be reflected on this map. But I'll pause there. I think I think Laura and then Jesse have their hands up. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna maybe reiterate Steve's concerns as being maybe not things that need mean we need to update the report or update the map, but things that need to make sure we need to know when there's discussions happening at the solar working group level that may be making assumptions about the map that we know are not correct, which I know Stephanie and Dwayne, you're on both of those calls, so you can help make sure that that's being translated there. Um, but yeah, that was just the point I wanted to make. Yep, no, appreciate that. Um, uh, and I think we, uh, and, and changes to the mapping, I think when it comes to what layers and how to, de uh, how to visualize the layers, those things I think 
may be able to be accommodated in terms of changes there because that's more of a internal GIS specialist uh, ask, if you will. There's not really an opportunity to go back to GZA um, to redo the, feasib the feasibility, uh, the 30 by 30 analysis. Um, but you know, if, if there, if we can get confirmation on the 50% uh, parcel issue, um, and then work with the GIS specialists to identify um, those parcels that have more than 50%, if that's something he can readily do, uh, then we can um, verify or not uh, the extent to which the map um, either over predicts or, or uh, accommodates that or, 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 or um, needs, needs, needs interpretation. Okay, and um, I, I just want to, well, okay, I just, just go to Jesse now. Go ahead, Jesse. I have a comment I might make. Yeah, it, just to, as you're taking it so well, Dwayne, I'm going to pile it on a little more. <laughs> um, I, I looked at hundreds of parcels and, and found that particularly in the purple zone, I, I did have a concern. Um, there's a, I saw a lot of this, which is um, heavily treed sites that are showing seven, six, six, seven, eight, and nine. And I'm seeing one, two, three, you know, maybe four or five roofs. And I, I think there's, I think there is a potential for misconception about where we could put solar. I know it's been said already, but I just wanted to bring up this visual. There's a lot that look like this. And if we can't change the color, of the squares anymore. It's just, I, I would bring that, if you haven't already had that conversation, I would bring it back and, and think about what that means um, just as far as like the perception, because I think the general perception is, oh, there's a lot of purple there. Good, bad, whatever, whether that's good or bad. And I, I don't think it's true. Yeah, if that if that was sort of the residential areas, um, then then um, you know we're not it indirectly impacts the working group because obviously we we're, we you know this concept or this idea of you know where if we want to accommodate so much solar in in in, ta in the town, then how much of it can go in the built environment, um, how much of it really can't go on the built environment. Uh, or needs to find other places that that analysis of of in the residential areas i i would agree it's a little bit you know there, there's that has to be taken into a, what happened what needs to be taken into account is you know of of residential rooftops what's a reasonable approximation of the percentage of those rooftops that are really likely to be able to move forward with solar and uh, is is the idea that like if a root if a building is in the purple zone then you'd go in ground truth and see and there was any, incentive right any it's 30 not by saying, 30 it's square not, needs to be ground truth yeah yeah, yeah right right obviously i mean it's like i looked at my house my house looks great but i'm in a forest you know uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh and, and that's like the whole echo hill neighborhood <laughs> so, you know, sort of like there's, if, there's some solar but if there is sun and room in this area then it's a good area and it's not awkwardly sloped and stuff like that yeah uh okay. so uh so right. um you know i'm not uh, um yeah it's at least for the working group we're more looking at the non-residential non-built environment yeah. uh again with with you know needing needing to keep in mind uh of the total solar that we might and, and you know that we might want to accommodate in, in amherst uh that um uh, you know, assuming that all this residential areas that are in, in uh, seem very feasible, only a, a percentage of that, and I'll, it'll be a, probably a fairly low percent, is like likely and feasible to go forward. Just looking at at uh, even you know national trends or, or even state trends in terms of percentage yeah. of residential roofs that that are are uh, are actually feasible. Right. And I think if I can pipe in, I think another important thing to remember is just that I forget what the numbers are, but when we first looked at this, we did estimates of, well, what percentage of the land would you need to use to meet the state goals and the local goals? And I think it was just a couple of percent anyway, 
right? So it's not a lot of this map that we're, you know, finding, using this as a tool to find a few places where we can meet those goals seems reasonable. Using it as a, certainly not designed to be a, uh, you we're know, not solar developers. And, and I would caution, I mean, like it's as a working group, uh, you can't help yourself, but going around town and looking at here and there, and it's like, I don't, our job as a working group, in my mind, at least, is not to identify, you know, Joe Smith's farm and say, here's, here's where the town thinks solar should go. Because that's just right. like, not, not what town government or, or, or us as represent, representatives of the town should be doing. Um, uh, but it's, right, but public meetings, the, the, the messaging that goes out, I think it, I, it's really, I'm glad to hear all this because this resonates with what I'm seeing. Hopefully, you know, there's mutually canceling errors and it's an approximation and it's a good idea. But I think I would encourage you, knowing that people are watching your meetings, to, to repeat that messaging over and over so people yeah. don't get the wrong idea right. from the map. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is just regarding the comment about um, the land being excluded for having uh, uh, habitat in it that's that's excluded wetlands and stuff like that. I can see a bunch of parcels on here, including in the Echo Hill neighborhood, that are uh, excluded, and I think it's because they're half wetland. Um, so I suspect that's already been done. I see you know lots of farms and things like that that are in the same category. There's a lot of wetland, so they're not they're not they don't show on the map at all. Um, yeah. Well, so if it's just, wetlands or or if it's in, in a restricted conservation right. restriction right. or um, town-owned land that's restricted for recreation, right. conservation, right. and so forth. Right. And you could turn on the layers on the lower right to find oh, out are there why. layers there? Yeah, so go yeah, to yeah, the yeah. lower oh, right. Yep, there there that's, yeah. the big, that's the big tool. And that's the big way to understand yep, got it. Yes. all of the unknown nice. information is you turn those layers on and off and you can figure out why things are not in it. It's, it's really a great uh tool that, yep. that the gis team put together and um very mike. nice <laughs> it's mike <laughs> okay well, it's gza and mike yep should we uh move on well let Time me just again? let me just finish up in the solar um, reporting um finish up first with the working group one is that um you know we are due to have a draft bylaw to the town um, by the end of the summer, September 1st, I believe is the date. Um, and so we are now more going to be focused for the rest of the summer on the bylaw language, uh, getting that drafted, uh, reviewed, scrutinized, public comment, at least within our meetings and so forth. Uh, we've we've um, you know done a fair amount of uh, and spent a lot of time uh, for good reason. Um, collecting information, doing the mapping and so forth. Uh, we're a little bit pressured for time uh, to now sort of get this all put together. So Christine uh, uh, has been diligent, diligently working on that. We've sort of been trying to compile the what we've drafted so far together, uh, but clearly some of the more interesting uh, parts of the bylaw with regard to how the discussion will play out and drafting on uh, particularly um, uh, how to look at zoning on in in uh, in our in the land that's uh, forested or farming um, is uh, sort of in front of us as uh, as kind of the two of the key areas that we need to uh, address over the next few working group meetings. Will ECAC have an opportunity to look at the language and comment on it? Um, I think the idea was to um, to at least share a draft with you all to provide some feedback at some point towards the end, I think. I think we would really appreciate that. I think there's, uh, yeah. And, and, uh, and then maybe my last comment, but maybe after Steve has a comment, yeah. Well, I had a question about the process that you'll be following. Um, right now, Christine has been doing a great job of finding all the regulations across Massachusetts that different communities have used, bringing them up for some discussion at your meetings. And then kind of based on a discussion-based model, they might get included into the draft or maybe get excluded. But there hasn't been a, any sort of formal voting on different 
parts of different um, potential restrictions. So once you get everything assembled, are you going to go through then and sort of vote section by section or on each particular restriction? Or is it going to be just kind of a big omnibus thing that people will vote up or down? I think that the goal is to reach the consensus on the issues as we go through them. So far, we've been able to do that when it comes to such things as um, um, buffer uh, 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 spacing between you know, the road and the fencing and the fencing setbacks and so forth. Um, Christine tends to come out with her, her um, uh, recommendations based on experience and so forth. And then we uh, sort of discuss and, and have reached pretty much consensus on those issues. Um, I think when we start getting into some of these more interesting uh, topics, there may be some additional discussion and maybe a need to vote in some form. Um, um, the, 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 um, what we, what we, I think we'll tend to do is, is try to push forward, maintain some highlighting of areas that still need to be discussed as we wrap around in sort of an iterative process. Um, I think importantly also is that we are not committing the town to this bylaw. <laughs> we are writing a bylaw with a recommendation to the town uh, to then go through their formal proceedings. I think at the end of the day, if I, I don't know how Stephanie views this, but if there is an area that we are just not able to reach consensus on, there could be um, a, um, a, 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 doc, a doc, the document could reflect that. If I may just offer an opinion from what I've seen, I think the consensus model works in many cases, but not all. And I think there are some members of the committee that are very quiet and don't speak up. And occasionally I hear something which I interpreted as maybe a disagreement with what becomes sort of the consensus. So I would encourage, particularly for those more contentious issues, um, to have votes as you as on each of those particular pieces going forward to allow those who are less likely to speak up in a conversation to be able to register their their opinions. Absolutely, and and I think I think when it's been coming to some of these more uh, contentious or debate 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 issues that people have been speaking up a bit more, uh, but um, but yes, uh, I I would agree that we're um, uh, you know. It, we, I'm not sure if we formally take in any votes, maybe in, a, in a, on a few occasions, but um, um, we're going to need to work work that out. And, and Dwayne, I and, think Stephanie had a comment there. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that it's very likely that if it gets to a point where there's a lot of um, disagreement, that staff will recommend that the committee come to a vote. That'll be a staff recommendation. I'm pretty sure. That's good. That's really good to hear. Um, um, I just wanted to conclude if, if the the, um, the solar update, which is more than the bylaw, but primarily the bylaw in terms of yep. what I think yeah, having to think about is that um, I did want to just um, keep in mind what I, uh, Laura basically brought up last time, or maybe it was the time before, um, while the working group is really focused on the unbuilt environment um, uh, as ECAC. Uh, not as the bylaw working group, but as ECAC, um, if there is a programmatic or, or informational or, or other things that we want to do as, as ECAC to um, support, promote, um, educate um, folks on solar in, in the built environment, residential, town buildings, um, carports, um, uh, and so forth. Then um, I don't. I don't have an update on that. I just was uh, um, piqued. Uh, my interest was piqued, certainly from Laura's suggestion. Um, and um, maybe that's an area that we can um, work on as as ECAC. That's uh, kind of distinct from from uh, the working group. Yeah, I can just jump in quickly, Dwayne. Thanks for that flag. Um, 
And sorry, I was unable to make the last meeting last minute and things have been quite busy for me, but I do still want to pursue that. There's been a lot of, um, and I sent this to Vasu and I'm not sure if it was mentioned at the last meeting, I admit to have not watched it. So I apologize. Um, but there's a lot of guidance coming out on particularly this new tax. It's not a tax credit because it's for people that don't pay taxes, but um, and there's a lot of concern from that, that I'm hearing that people don't know about this, um, municipalities and faith-based yep. um, organizations and other NGOs or non-tax paying entities um, maybe aren't aware that there's this really substantial new um, incentive for them. So um, I've collected some information, like the White House has a fact sheet and there's a few other things coming on. So maybe on the next agenda, next meeting, I can plan to present this back. And I think I had agreed to like draft a letter of some sort and I still have that on my to-do list, but I have not had a chance to do it. Super. Thanks, Laura. Okay, shall we move on to the annual report review? Just had one last question. The, the Massachusetts statewide is undertaking a technical potential of solar study, which was supposed to be finished this summer, actually earlier, I think. Um, it's been a little bit slow. Do Duane happen to have any inside information about when that report might be completed? Yeah, I, I, I did hear straight from DOER actually uh, that they were um, anticipating that that should be done in about a month, and this was probably a couple, a week or so ago. Uh, so maybe July, uh, we'll see it. Um, so it, it is it is getting closer. When I was at DOER, we always said soon. <laughs> uh, but I think it's getting sooner. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I think it's it's not a, a long wait anymore, uh, but um, you know, it could be, it could be a, a couple of weeks, it could be a month, I would say. Okay, good. I think that might be an interesting result to look at and compare that to the GCA mapping. I think Absolutely. it has somewhat different methodology, so it'll be interesting Absolutely. to see where the how much they overlap. Yeah, and and do you know uh, Mass Audubon is doing another mapping. I've talked to them. They're 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 probably not going to have anything available until uh, September timeframe. I think is what they were uh, uh, thinking about. So a bit a bit. Um, or maybe even later in, in sometime in the fall is what they were saying. So there that that'll be a bit after the the state assessment. No, oh, that'll be another good resource. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll move on to the annual report. Oh wait a minute, one more Andra. Just bef before we move on, I, I want to apologize. I'm having some internet issues, and so I'm going to keep my visual off to be able to stay on the call. <laughs> That's fine. All right, so um, I will share what I have as the last report. I hope this is the right one. If I can find it. You can have annual report, share. Now, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so uh, you guys are gonna have to fill me in a little bit on, I know there's a couple of things that are missing. And I think uh, I can just deal with if Vasu's not going to, but where did the discussion leave off? What are the most important things to get at? I think this all looked pretty good to me until the sector on uh, So I, the way it was left, Lori, I believe was that Don was gonna provide the text for that. Right. And and I think that since we're sort of on hold there, um, I can probably talk to Don and fill this in if, if if he's having trouble finding time to just write a few paragraphs, sentences, even. Yeah, I don't think it needs to be much. Right. Because it's sort of on hold. And was there anything else? I think um, there were the... town manager goal recommendations, but do these go in here or did they come out? I'm a little confused about this section. 
I mean, I agree with everything on here, but does it belong in the report or is the report used to establish these or? I have, I'm fine with it in there, but I think the order of things was that the report goes in in July, the town manager's goals are discussed later toward the end of the calendar year. So I might suggest that we, I think we should maximize any opportunity we have to get something in front of the council, but I also don't want to have this be it, right? So what maybe I would suggest is to say that like, based on this report, here are some initial recommendations for town manager goals. And we look forward to being consulted on additional goals. So like, just to leave the door open for our consultation. Um, because there's a couple things here that, I mean, first, you know, I think we need to see how we how we've worked towards how the town manager is reporting towards his, his current goals. There's also some higher level things. Like these are all very specific and I don't know if they will like come across in goal form. So we might want to work with the town, with someone, I don't know who, um, to make them more goal oriented. Uh, to polish to, what's a good word? finalize these to polish them to make them more yeah and i mean i would say like I, I might say up front here like climate action needs to be a lens applied to every single town manager to to all the goals um where relevant um so and here are some specific things that we know need to be implemented and like we look forward to working with or we, we hope that the council can consider these as part of the town manager goals and we would be happy to provide additional guidance or feedback or something, some language like that. Like that, but here we present some specific suggestions. Yeah, I see Stephanie's hand up. She might have. Go ahead, Stephanie. I was hoping you would clarify this process a bit. Um, well, I mean, it's kind of your process. I think it's fine. I think to Laura's point, good to just get something, but it doesn't preclude that you can't have additional goals or input at the point where the town manager is creating those and reviewing them with the council. So I think, you know, like I think Laura's suggestion was spot on. Just sort of say these are your additional, are uh, um, your, I'm sorry, your initial goals, and then you'll probably provide more feedback later. Um, what I was going to respond to was uh, Laura's call for climate action being um, included in all the goals. I think this has come up before, and I don't think that the town is in any way adverse to that. It's just that it's not clear um, what the application of that looks like. Um, there has been a request, there's been offers for meeting with department heads to sort of talk about that. And then that sort of initially happened, but then there was nothing really sort of concrete offered in terms of language or what that looks like. So I think if your suggestion for that could be a little more specific, not you, Laura, specifically, just you as a committee, if you could come up with some more concrete examples of maybe other communities um, or you know, if if you're thinking about something specific, then could you identify that? Because I think there's a little confusion on on the town side for that. Um, you know, and I think we've tried to do it to an extent that we can, where it seems more logical. But these are the things that we're not sure. Like, um, I, I can't think. I'm just trying to think of like another department off the top of my head. But like, you know, for the rec program, maybe it's like you know, vehicles are all. Um, you know, EVs that transport people within the town, you know, just sort of very specific concrete things, actions that might be relevant. Okay, do we want to brainstorm a few of those or do we want to look at what other towns are doing or? Go ahead, Steve. 
I, th I think that's good to give it some specificity, as Stephanie suggested. On the other hand, I'd sort of defer to the experts, the, the, the leads of those departments, to think about the problem and come up with the solutions based on their existing experience and expertise. So I don't want to give them too many specific suggestions. Maybe some as examples to get them thinking would be appropriate. But the idea is that for each of those uh, leaders within each of the departments to, to really think about, okay, here's the problem that we're facing. How can my group come up with solutions? Um, I think that's kind of the, the hope when we say decisions are made with a, of a climate lens as part of the decision-making process. I like that idea of putting something in there, simply asking each department head or leader of each group or whatever the right terminology is to think a little about how they could make an impact on greening their department and what that looks like, maybe make a few suggestions um, and get some feedback back to, I don't know, to us for ideas, um, things we, you know, if they need our help with something, then maybe we can yeah. turn around and do something too, right? So. Does that make sense, Stephanie? I see your hands up again. Yeah, my only, I mean, and I like Steve's suggestion. I think my only point was that you all have offered to meet with people and to give them some guidance because yeah. some of them are having a hard time wrapping around their heads on what that means. Like it's not um, as easy for the assessor to maybe just say off the top of their head, how does that, how does greening my department work? So, I mean, there are certain things that could sort of apply to all departments in town in terms of like you know how it relates to sort of staff travel and that kind of thing but when you're talking about greening the department they're not always clear so again if you have at least even some i think steve your your point is well taken but i think to give them at least some ideas of you know examples for them to start to help them in that process of thinking i think that's where they're stuck stephanie how about um just brief one-on-one -on -one meetings. I mean, if you can provide us with a list of the, I mean, I don't know my way around the town administration that well, who are the key players that we would want to meet with? And do we have maybe a volunteer just to meet with them for 20 minutes one day to brainstorm a little bit and to talk about what it means? Because I think anyone on this committee could probably have some, have an interesting discussion on that point, right? You might not know much about what that particular person does, but we could ask them, you know, right. what do you do and how do you do it? And what are some things and just brainstorm with them a little bit. Does that make sense? It does. The committee did that in, way in the beginning. So I think it's fine to do that again. I think you should coordinate through me. I can, you know, if people, um, I mean, it's, there's, I think 12 or 13, I think 13 department heads. So, um, you know, you could sort of revisit how we did it in the beginning in terms of who met with whom, um, you know, some of those department heads have changed now. So it's actually maybe good timing. So then maybe we'll make it as one of our goals in this report to meet with department heads in the next year to talk about this. Hmm. Will that solve the problem? I'll figure out a way to wordsmith this to say something like that. Um, to fit it, I'm not sure it fits in this section anymore, but to fit it in somewhere. Okay, that's good. So Stephanie, can I ask a question on the process here? So yeah. the town, there's the town manager goals right. that are ultimately approved by the town council, correct? Correct. Okay. And are what are you saying that the that the department heads submit ideas for what will be in those goals? Or are you talking about a different process, like the work planning of each of the departments? I think it's a little bit different process. I mean, they're and things are obviously related, but they're a little bit different. Like, I think we're talking about what came up was climate should be in all, you know, in all departments, in all decision making, right? So that's involves the department heads. So, and ultimately, you might want the town manager to have that goal of ensuring that all the department heads implement that strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what the big picture goal is. Um, but in terms of my, 
you know, the offer has come up before and there were discussions before on how to get department heads sort of more informed or knowledgeable about what types of things they might be looking to do has come up before. And I'd say like in order for the town manager to implement that strategy, mm -hmm. you're going to need to work with department heads a little bit because it's fine to have it. It's just like to blanketly state it without some support is I'm saying they just need some support in making that happen. Yeah. So that's that's helpful. So I think what then I would suggest is that we add a town manager goal related to what Stephanie just said around. And then we include here that like our contribution to that is that we are willing and able to meet. And and so like that's a kind of a, and maybe we can approach this section like that. Anyway. I think that would be that would be an example in my mind of like a good town manager goal that then we can also support on. The one thing that has happened, I would say, since you all sort of came up with this, you know, a few years back, was that in all of our um, capital requests, there are specific questions that sort of ask, do the requests um, benefit climate? and adhere to the CARP goals in some way? If so, how? So there's more, like there's more meat to it. It's not just a yes or no. It's like you have to explain how and why. So, I mean, in terms of at least procurement, which I think is important, there's at least some movement in that direction that didn't used to exist. Those, okay, so the, all the, capital, all capital has to include that. So that's already happening. So we don't need to include that as a Correct. That's already Excellent. happening. That's but that's nice. capital. That's like a very specific piece of it. It's not, you're talking broadly, so there's yeah. way more. You know, and I think this sort of thing is is really important. I, I know that Vasu is very big on making exponential changes and figuring out how to make exponential change, but I think talking to people is one of the best things that you can do. Um, yeah, you know, we, you put ideas in people's heads and it it propagates, right? It, it, they talk to other people, and so I think I think this sort of thing is important. Um, all right, so I can wordsmith that a little bit and send it around. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Can I just add one more point? This is not specific to a town manager goal, but I think in this document somewhere, and maybe it I haven't reviewed it since the last time, since before the last meeting. So, um. This is, I mean, we are a committee of the town manager and this is a report, but this report is going to the town council. And so I think something we need to reiterate to the town council is that they also have some responsibility here. I was extremely disappointed in a lot of things, but a lot of things related to the planning board um, okay, nomination or whatever that. of people. But like one thing that was very clear is that none of the interview questions for planning board candidates had anything around climate mm -hmm. in them. And that's honestly unacceptable at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So like, I think we need to, you know, just as we're asking the town manager to, and the town departments to inter integrate climate, the town council needs to be doing, doing the same. Like we should not be asking questions of potential, um, planning board or zoning board or, or many maybe other committees that don't at least acknowledge the fact that we have these climate goals that we're trying to meet and and so I don't know where we could add that into this report but I think it would be a missed opportunity not to flag that for the council Should that they were the ones that approved the targets and they are being also being held responsible for for us meeting them okay go ahead Stephanie I was just going to say in terms of the promise uh the sorry, the process of um, appointing committee members, it really starts through the town manager's office. Um, so the council basically would approve the appointments, but they're not the ones doing the interviews. So I, as I- Who needs up the interview questions then? Well, that's, um, I think sometimes it's either department heads or department heads working with the town manager. So I'm, I'm Personally, I'm surprised because I wasn't aware of that. Um, so I think that's, you know, it may not be the town council that has to 
think about that. It, that, but that I think that's something that maybe should be included in the town manager's goals is that interviews for committee appointments need to address climate change or include questions on climate change. Like I would put that with a town manager goal. Okay, we can definitely stick that as a goal, right? That's just yes. interview questions for new, is it committee appointments? Yes. Uh, really any appointment, any town appointment, I would think. Yeah, we wrote a letter to that effect at one point as well to the town manager. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers that. We put together, we sort of, I think they were putting together a building committee and we put together sort of a general recommendation some very good positive language about this is this is the yeah you remember that Andrea? wasn't that for the school maybe it was for the probably school. for the yeah, building I, committee for the, school, the building yeah. committee but i think we asked that it sort of expand to all appointed positions if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. I, really i'd like to say that um that's it and and Laurie, you received a letter from the Amherst Climate Justice Alliance yeah. that's relevant to this. And um, along the lines of what you said about talking to people goes a long way. Um, I I think a part of the point of that letter was to bring the town manager directly into conversation with us. Um, and uh, we haven't had that for a long time. There are you know, new members of the committee who have never been a part of a conversation with the town manager. And I think it would be very useful for us to you know, have that, that an open-ended conversation uh, about how He's doing and in reaching his goals. I know that Stephanie is the person he turns to for that, but um, it's different to talk to him directly. Right. So how do we? How would we do that if we could? Right. What? What has to be done there? Can we have a conversation directly with the town manager at some point? I mean, he did appoint us, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I don't know, and and the relevance to the report may be that the report itself is a, the vehicle for um, him joining us and having that open-ended conversation. Can, um, can we request that, Stephanie? Can we request that he show up at one of our meetings? Or you can we... request it. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> You probably should then, but what, what's the best timing for that? After the report is put together for sure. I think probably after we've thought um, in more depth about um, goals that we would want to recommend for the town council to have and, and discuss them with the town manager. So that sort of segues us, we, we've sort of already been talking about it, but maybe we should just keep talking about these goals a little bit more then, um, and then we really should move on. Uh, we should probably put this on the agenda again for next time, continuing to talk about these goals and what we want to discuss with the town manager if we were to invite him. So what else goes on this, this list or I just want to, because I probably won't be here by the time this conversation happens. Um, we need a historical perspective um, on the goals that we recommended the previous year as well as what we are now going to recommend. Um, and to hear from him what obstacles he has you know, come up against or um, just, you know, it didn't get to the top of the list or, you know, where is it at? We're halfway through the year now. How, you know, for his goals, not for the fiscal year. And that's um, a good time to take stock. 
So it could go both to the past and to the future. Maybe I'll try to put together a sort of list of um, not just well questions, uh, a his, a, a, some sort of a summary of what was suggested and questions to ask them how, you know, exactly along these lines, how is this going and what are the challenges and what's, you know, what are the sticking points that we might be able to help with? Something like that. Yeah, I, would, I, I will think about this. I think that's a good suggestion. I mean, we have the information that we shared with. So, so we got at, you know, we got offered to supply recommendations or ideas to the council. Some of them got accepted and some of them didn't. So I think we need to go back to both the town council, the goals that were set and the goals we recommended to Andre's point and have a sit down with him and, and say like, how are you working on the goals that made it? Here are some goals we wanted that didn't get made. Like, what are your thoughts on these? I don't think we have to spell that out in this report. I think we can just say that we're going to do that. I think and this is separate. I think the request for a meeting with him and all of this stuff around it is separate from the report that we're preparing. Yeah, but what I would again, and I'm going to get on my soapbox again about this, there is absolutely no requirement of the council to even ask us for our input on these. And I think that's yeah. all in my mind, this is all, all of these problems stem from that. So like, I think we just need to clarify in here that we do want to be involved in giving feedback on the town manager goals um, because this is going to be read by the town council supposedly, right? Okay. I think part of the feedback we got last year was we were too late and that's why we are starting much earlier. Yeah, but I call bullshit on that because like there's no, I mean, I'm sure that's true, but like we should be, we should not be an advisory committee if we have to do, like, if we're supposed to do these things, someone needs to, we need to be built into the process. We're not built into the process. Like, luckily, we were even considered as an afterthought, right? But like, there's no requirement for them to even consider us in, in that process. Right. Um, so I think putting it in here now is getting that ahead of the, getting ahead of the game and, and being more proactive to say we want to be involved in this. But Again, there's no requirement for the council to even do that. Okay, I'd sort of like to move on at this point, but I think I know I have some action items that I will do and send out just a, um, I'll send out another version of the of the annual report and I will put something else, it might not be immediately, but I'll try to put something together to talk about in the way of how do we have a discussion with the town manager and what are the talking points and what is the historical perspective that we need? And Stephanie, I might be in contact with you for some information around that. Of course. Uh, okay, Steve, go ahead, but that, but quickly. One option, Lori, might be for you to request a meeting with a town manager, just you and he as a, the new chair of ECAC, just to get to know you kind of meeting and that right. might be a good strategy to take. If he doesn't want to meet with all of us, I think that would be the obvious thing to try next. Yeah, you, you might do it you, in addition to. Yeah, you and the new vice chair. Right. Yeah. Solomon. Right. And then in some of the correspondence that Stephanie sent us, um, the town council had replied to Vasu about when ECAC may present this report to town council. Yeah. Those are dates in September. Are we going to talk about those too? Do we need to pick a date now? It's probably not too early. I think it was their, the town council preference that we September. schedule a date early. Okay, so why don't we pick a date in September? Um, it's going to be a little bit difficult. What date is town? What, when and where does town council meet again? Someone remind me. Look, there were two dates. Um, was it? Where was it? Was it in that? Oh, it was in Vasu's email message. His his final message to us. I think uh, is one of the open ended things. Yes, yes, yes. I'm coming um, up with it. Um, annual report is the headline. Um, September 11th or 18th. You got it. Yep. 11th or 18th. And what time is the council meeting at? They start at 6.30, um, but that doesn't mean that's when you would. Right. 
be presented. Start at 6.30 p.m. and go to about 6.30 a.m., it seems. <laughs> <laughs> I so that was the 11th or the 18th correct yeah uh, i can do either of those so i i would suggest the 11th because sometimes things get bumped oh good point and that would mean maybe there's a place to get bumped too <laughs> and they get bumped for good reason so we would present the report hopefully they'll have the report before then but we'll present it then and talk about ten town manager goals at that point. Is that correct? And if you noted, there was a time constraint of like five minutes per topic. Yeah. <laughs> Just want to point that out. Five minutes for the whole presentation or five minutes for each, the presentation and the top and the suggested goals. Um, five minutes, five for minutes each. each. Of those. Yeah. Of those. Okay, 10 minutes. I got it. <laughs> I will need a reminder of that, but I can I can do that. <laughs> All right. So no long PowerPoint for PowerPoints, just maybe a one pager. Um, okay, moving on then. Uh, I think we are at special. We sort of done the town manager goals and the annual report review. So we're on to specialized stretch code. For the for the minutes, can I just have a point of clarification? Do we so Lori, will you respond to Lynn or Stephanie, will you respond to Lynn regarding um, the point. date? It, whoever, I mean, I'm happy to, but Lori, you might want to as the new chair to okay. introduce yourself as well. Okay. Let me make myself a note. Have, Lori, just please copy me on that. Okay. About dates for the um, report. Copy second. Okay, got it. And also, um, especially for you, Jesse, and you, Lori, that just a reminder that your correspondence with um, the town manager or the um, president of the council, you should copy me. Just a reminder that all correspondence is public record. So just be just note that. Right. I was a federal employee for 17 years. <laughs> know how that works. I'm a state employee now. All right. So um, Specialized stretch code. Where are we with that? Um, who's nope. uh, Andre? Or that's me. Or is that Jesse? Okay, go ahead. Jesse. Oh, that's right. That was the, uh, the you. You were actually at a meeting last week. Yeah. How so did that go? just quickly, show of hands. I know. I think Steve was that. Was who? Did anyone see that besides Steve? Okay. Great. Um, you should watch, watch the recording. No, please. <laughs> I want to start by just contextualizing that I I think the pol the town council is under it's a it's a it's a difficult job and there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot going on. I watched the meeting at home until about eight thirty, and then I drove into town and presented in person and watched for another hour and presented in person. And I think we should not take light the burden that is their job and I want to say that very clearly and, and we feel very strongly about what we're doing and the climate and I believe in it but I I think and I tried as best I could although I did get frustrated at one point to offer us really to try to set a precedent where we're helping them make good decisions and taking don't not adding to their burden so that's the context. Um, Anna, Anna presented with, along with me, we went very quickly. They were, it was late. Um, they'd been through a lot already. And um, 
ultimately there was a vote taken to decide if they were going to even keep talking about it, which means sending it to CRC, which passed. Two people who expressed concern, two or three, I think two people who had expressed concern about taking that time basically saying like, we have no extra time between now and the end of the year to even talk about this. They did not vote no, they abstained. So I also think there is some strong political will to uh, on the part of the council to come down on the side of being, fighting climate change. No one's willing to say no, I think, but they legitimately said like, is this a good idea? And and I want to just, and so it passed and it is going to committee and I have offered and will take that on as part of this group to support that process for them, try to get them answers to whatever questions they have. And right now, I think the, what, what was interesting as I prepared for this and looked at the updated dates on what's happening right now, in July 1st, so right now, this town is completely up to date with this year's residential and commercial stretch code updates. We automatically update on the stretch code. What we're proposing, the soonest the specialized code, code could come into play would be July 1st of next year. At that time, we automatically bump up to the next level of the stretch code on July 1st of next year. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword. It's like, is this the hill we die on when a large portion of this, um, a, lot of, a lot of the meat of the energy efficiency is gonna happen no matter what. Um, and then, but I think there's a lot of value and I tried to make this clear at the meeting. I think there's a lot of value and I think it was Laura, you were the one, or maybe it was Vasu who put this in our PowerPoint. Just like, we're sending a message that, uh, that towns want to push the state. We want to adopt it. We want to meet the goals and the sort of nuts and bolts of what's happening maybe isn't as important. I really believe that all of the difficult stuff of the energy code is happening no matter what, and that the specialized add-on doesn't, I think it brings a lot of value without bringing a lot more difficulty. The only other thing I will say to report back is that I found, I, I thought that Paul, we, we did the due diligence to meet with the town staff who, conceded that this really doesn't affect them. And then Paul's comment was, this is really complicated. It's gonna be a burden on our staff. And I think, I, I just, if anyone does end up watching it, I, I, I don't know what to make of that. Um, if it was a political, I think he wants to support his staff. He should be supporting his staff. So if that's what it was, that's a good thing. Um, but it was, it, it gave me pause. And then the only other thing that gave me pause was one of the members of the council referred to this as willy nilly, which I took exception to. So I say all of this to say like, these guys are under a ton of pressure of stuff that is, I would say more immediate and more intense and more personal and more charged than what we're doing. And so, we, I want to be very respectful of their time and very, and, and they have some legitimate concerns about us taking up their time. So they had some smart pushback. They want to make sure we're not wasting their time. So again, I'd like to do this in a way to really take the opportunity to show them that we're not wasting their time. We're not just rattling their cage, but we're actually, you know, as best as we can, we're, we're a committee that is supporting them to make this decision so that we will continue to have their ear moving forward. Yeah, the Paul pushing back after, so who, you, you talked to the staff or who talked to staff? Steph, uh, Stephanie and I both yeah. met with them at, twice and right. I yeah. got no sense from them and we, it was a pointed question that, and I don't want to, I don't want this to be a record of putting Paul on the spot or, it, it, but I, 
I, it, I, it just alerted me to the, that this is not about counting carbon. This is about politics. Yeah. And, and I thought it was a very important lesson for me, like, to be perfectly honest, I was ruffled <laughs> by the whole thing. I, th I found it to be, I found the whole politics of it to be a little, like, I was a little, uh, deregulated even and got a little frustrated during the meeting I, Steve might not have noticed in watching it. <laughs> you covered pretty well there, Jesse. So, so did, did your composure. You, yeah, I, I'm guessing you probably didn't speak up. And did you say that you actually spoke with staff and they seemed okay with it or? That was you? a big part of our presentation. Okay. Was making that abundantly clear. So again, I think what I'm learning is like, there's some politics in here and there's, and, and people are saying things that don't necessarily, that are like, and that might not be a bad thing. I just think it's something we want to be aware of and just yeah. really mindful and respectful moving ahead, like as best we can. Okay. That makes me want to talk to Paul all the more. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. All right, uh, Steve, go ahead. I think what I also heard, I believe, was an underlying concern about the specialized code, uh, its impact on housing prices and housing costs. And as you said, Jesse, there's a legitimate concern there. I think there's legitimate responses to those concerns, but that that was, I think, some of the, the concern from the counselors as well. So the task going forward will be to explain the benefits of the specialized code. And if there are higher upfront costs, how those are offset by operating costs. And, and I have all the materials costs. for you because there was just in the last week a big back and forth on the BEA about some other town had this objection that it was going to raise the cost of housing. Mm. And by so much not taking into account any of the incentives that are out there or, you know, so it, it, it's not right. <laughs> yeah, it's, and there's, there's a, a great lot article of great in, Yeah. I just gonna say there's an article in the, in the Boston Globe yesterday. Right, that's it. That was the response. They, people Good. were very upset about it. Go ahead. And I'm trying to keep up with this stuff, but I would say if I'm going to be, I'm thinking of, I think a way to do this would be to try to proactively put together sort of an FAQ that's custom to the concerns. And I'll, I'm going to reach out to Anna and, and sort of, maybe we can get a list of questions and come more prepared to answer. So if, if people are welcome to just forward me articles and I'll keep a, a tally of that. I mean, even the national, even an article entitled "The New Net Zero Code Might Make It Cost Prohibitive to Build Houses." Yeah, you read the article, and, and what it says is it it could raise the price by you know two percent, and as someone that and they're so someone that is knows a little bit about this, you can reduce the price of a home by two percent pretty easily too. There's other, there's so much other, it, it, the article didn't support the headline at all. The, yeah. the data didn't support the headline. So I think there's some really strong, compelling information out there. I don't think we have to bend facts or like over promise anything. I think it's a, I think it's a, I've just got to, I want to do the work and, and try to show them uh, what, uh, what people are saying. Other, uh, Stephanie, go ahead. And then, I uh, just wanted to say as um, a department head who was not aware, and I'm sorry, I could not watch the meeting that night. I had another obligation. Um, I was not aware of this comment and um, that I will be trying to sort of find out things on my end as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think I saw Andre and Duane. I'm not sure who was first. Andre. Yeah. Andre, go ahead. As we go through our um, machinations, machinations, whatever that is, um, I want to raise uh, people's awareness that um, next week there's hearings on a number of very important bills about buildings, um, including one that's quite simply uh, with very, very few carve outs says all buildings, all new buildings should be all electric, period. It, it, 
and save the municipalities from this ridiculous and and you know time consuming energy consuming work so that the bill is sponsored by rep khan in the house she was the one to um put it forward last session as well and that's where we need to go. You know, specialized stretch code is minute in its, you know, effect on Amherst. And I think what we yeah. need to remember is that there is um, a tendency among some of our politicians to have um, a reaction about getting uh, too far out front. And so the solve for that is we're not, we're behind. Right. Here's all the towns that are ahead. Yeah. And just to be clear, our, the town council was incredibly gracious and by majority in favor of this. So I want to be clear. I was just wanted to, I was just particularly taken aback by some of the pushback that I wasn't prepared for. Um, I think they are excited about this and wanting to support this moving forward in nice. general. Okay, any more comments on this or shall we move on? It is getting late. I was just gonna add, Jesse, I think that's absolutely right. There was there was a victory at the meeting and we don't wanna criticize things and, and yeah. grab, yeah. grab the feet from the, <laughs> from the victory. <laughs> I, I would just add, um, just on the, as much as there's, great climate sensitivity there's also a lot of sensitivity on on affordable how affordability of housing um and for better or for worse that is normally thought of as upfront costs of the of the of the of the, of the house um and i can see the politics or at least the um concerns that that our leaders at the council would be concerned about with regard to adopting a policy without some real deliberation uh, that could have the impact of even increasing by one or two percent the cost of housing not for you and I but for the lowest income uh you know sector of, of the of Amherst and so forth that being said I think uh, and and I didn't see the presentation let me say uh, that really appreciate the work that went into this and and uh and it does sound like you talked about the incentives a bit I think it's really important uh, to talk about okay, what are what are some of the complementary policies that the state's moving forward in terms of helping to reduce this upfront cost, um, and uh, particularly as it may a, a, align with lower income uh, support. Um, and then I would also, while it's still probably a year away or more, there is the climate bank uh, that is being put together in in uh, in Massachusetts that I think a main target of that is going to be building um, building electrification fund, funds to support uh, or financing to support building electrification um, and you know maybe that will work out so that there's a you know if the mortgage if the mortgage rate or something can be attached to the uh, in some way the operating cost of the facility that would really help out um uh and, and some of this uh cli this uh climate bank may have that kind of effect but we'll have to to wait and see on that yeah no that's super helpful to remember that's all those conversations that are going to be upcoming the affordable housing i think and i do think it is a perception problem not a factual problem okay jesse thanks again for taking that on i see oh laura you have your hand up go ahead i just wanted to say the same thing that it's a perception problem and also i would just flag well Dwayne, i think everything you said is correct I think when we're talking about the renters, we need to be careful not to be saying, because if a someone building a new facility on gas or without the energy efficiency that it, that it needs to have is putting that burden on their renters. Yeah, absolutely. So the yeah. question yeah. is, who is the cost? Who is it going to be more costly for? Even if it's a tiny bit more costly right now, although I don't even agree that's the case, then it, it it's going to be harder to operate in the future and it's going to create a burden on our town so i just think at any turn we need to push back on that because i think it's a false narrative that is 
hurting our ability to um, push forward on some of yeah, these issues. Particularly in a town that doesn't have access to natural gas. <laughs> so we're talking about- Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so let's move on. Uh, next on the topic on the agenda is uh, staff updates. Stephanie? Sure, I don't want to take a whole lot of time, but um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that for the August 2nd meeting, uh, the fellows will be presenting their projects to you um, I'd like to give them a half hour each, if that's possible, so that it gives them time to present and you time to ask some questions. Um, so just wondering if that's possible to give them that kind of time. That should be fine. And also to note that I think one of them is, is on being, right now. Is being put to sleep by this meeting as we speak. <laughs> I know, Hi, I could, I know. Caitlin, can I, can I bring you in for... Uh, real quick, Caitlin, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm just going to bring you in just to say hello. Okay, you can unmute yourself and just say hi, and you can put on your camera too. Hello, um, let me see if I can get my camera. I don't know if I have that option right now, actually. Okay, that's okay. Um, but nice surprise. it's nice to be listening in, getting some context, not falling asleep at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love these kinds of meetings. So um, it's nice to be meeting you all here and looking forward to presenting in early August. Okay. Nice to meet you, Caitlin. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Forward to hearing from you. So um, yeah, they've been doing an incredible job. Um, Miguel, you will meet. He's actually on vacation this week. So you will meet him um, on the 2nd as well. So um, okay. So thank you um, for giving them that time. And then just um, in general, um, I think I updated you last time that we are proposing to locate the fast charging station um, in the CVS lot. So I have submitted the um, application to Eversource. So we should be hearing back from them about that. I do need to find out, I, I'm looking to potentially try to find an additional five dual head uh, level two chargers uh, locations. I don't know if I have to ensure that we get the fast charging unit in because it's the same program. So I'm not sure if that has to happen and be completed before I can apply for those other stations. But that's kind of on my radar to sort of see if we can maximize getting, um, getting those additional stations sooner than later. Um, so that's on the radar. Um, and then I think we're talking about um, <clears throat> funding projects for um, through green communities for the fall. One of the potential projects that we could investigate the possibility for is for one building electrification project. So getting it off fossil fuels, there's a half a million dollar grant funding for that through green communities. We potentially are already moving that direction for town hall now. So um, the the only thing is that if we do get that funding, it ties us up for two years. But quite honestly, I don't know how much we'd have available moving forward anyway in the Green Communities Program. So I don't think I think that would be a really um, good focus for us to sort of consider either that five hundred thousand dollar grant funding for two years, or do we go with I think the maximum we can request this year is two hundred thousand dollars. Um, we could also request that for the same project. Um, it just means we would like add that to funding that we have already uh, for this project. So we might be able to do a bit more. So anyway, it's just, that's one of the things we're uh, considering. Another request was to look at potentially doing this for Cracker Farm. So again, we have to sort of decide what's the most feasible application for moving one of these two buildings to be um, fossil fuel free. So we have to start somewhere. <laughs> so, um, so it's exciting for me. It's exciting to like actually be having these conversations with people that are receptive. <laughs> it's like, great. So that's really nice. Um, so, uh, that's moving forward. I do want to say, and I don't know why I've been so reluctant to say this, but we've actually met our 20% municipal reduction goal for green communities below our baseline year. Uh, we met it 2022. And I think I've been reluctant to share it because in my mind, I can't help but being stuck on the fact that it's very much because we're not doing our meetings in person. 
So for me, I'm just feeling like, oh, that's kind of false because if we were doing up, you know, business as usual, we probably wouldn't be meeting that goal. But we did meet it. So I'm going to say it out loud because <laughs> we did. And currently, as we are operating, we have met that goal of 20% reduction from our baseline um, energy use, which was 2011, I believe. And this is for the green communities reporting. This isn't our bigger CARP. That's separate. This is just specifically for municipal building yes. and municipal energy use. Okay, Jesse, you have a question about that? I just think it's so important, the phrase business as usual. There's no way we're meeting any goals doing business as usual. And I think it's really exciting no matter how it happened, even if it was a disruptive illness, to say it's possible, different things are possible, and that it will not include business as usual. So I think it's a strong and wonderful thing that you should be shouting out because we it's will, got a great message. It is, and I, I've asked Caitlin to, inc to include some of that in her reporting so that it's actually captured in the in in the update so um and i will be i will i will actually um as we apply for this next round i think what i'm going to do is kind of try to build that into um some kind of a press release we should so. find a way also to perpetuate the virtual meetings then right i mean how do we i've been saying all along that it's i mean for one thing we get way more participation by meeting virtually, but also I've been saying as well that it does reduce the the energy intensity, um, the use of any of the buildings, as well as the transportation for people to get here. So if this so, is a state policy though, that it has to be live meetings or is it a local policy? No, right now it's a, it's, it's a state open meeting law requires meetings to be in person. Right now that's been suspended because of COVID and it was extended until I think March 15th of 2024, 25. It was extended wanted, another two years. So we should probably approach our local, this is something for all of us to take note of, to approach our local representatives and senator, state senator, and ask them to change the open meeting law so that we can keep doing this. But let's not discuss that now. I think there's um, some, I think there's some movement in that direction. Yeah. And the I Lord- I actually disagree. What, you disagree? I think, I think there's a lot to discuss about this. Okay, so maybe another time. <laughs> I think moving a lot of our public discourse online has done a lot to create this political atmosphere that Jesse was describing. Mm. Um, and so I think we have to balance those two things. Maybe it's public com you know, I think there's ways to work around it. Like if you want to make a public comment, you should come in person or I don't I don't know, or maybe not, but like I just feel like our online discourse has really just made everything a little bit less um collaborative and constructive. I have some comments about that, but I'm going to save them for another time, um, or maybe even just offline between you and me, Laura. There's a bunch of questions I'd like to ask, but uh, I think uh, we don't have time to have that discussion now. So yeah. let's maybe think about it another time. It might be worthy of discussing open meetings and uh, at another uh, as an agenda item sometime, and what we can do about that. Um, all right. So other uh, uh, quickly, Stephanie, is the heat pump RFP still in? Legal? Yes. So it has, it, it is going under uh, legal review. There has been some uh, response. I think the question is not about having, like the, the RFP has written, we actually got a lot of kudos for that. Um, the sticking point is about the actual incentive because it's ARPA funding. Somehow it has to be, um, it has to be tied somehow to either the pandemic or like whether or not, um, I think the, the recommendation was like, is the town's fossil fuel use greater than the average state fossil fuel use? So I actually have um, Caitlin actually sort of looking at that on our behalf. Um, so there has to be some way to tie it in to get the actual um, incentive for the pumps themselves. We can do all the education, we can do all the outreach. It's the actual purchase of the pumps and or providing incentive towards the purchase of the pumps. 
So anyway, that's kind of the last sticking point. So it's kind of holding things up a little bit further, but for the most part, it looks good, which is, that was great feedback at least. So a little more to go. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna move quickly on to ECAC member updates. Any updates other than what we've talked about? Only, only that yesterday was the hottest day ever. Ever, on the history of the planet, that's right. Well, no, 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 in, in recorded history. Recorded history, right, sorry, not the history of the planet. <laughs> well, I think there were some other hot days at the beginning. Yes. Near the beginning, it was very hot. So yes. keep up the good work, everybody. Yeah, pretty scary. Um, okay, items for the next meeting agenda. Do we still wanna have that map discussion or did we get out what needed to be gotten out today? I would, I would still like to raise that, but I may not be available at the next two meetings. I'm, I'm gonna be traveling for business. So maybe for July, for August. Yeah, but not the August 2nd meeting, I think. I'm also, I'm away August until August 14th, uh, 16th. Um, just to note that I'm away on the 16th of August. <laughs> um, what happens to these meetings when you're away? Well, we get somebody else to just start them and the chair okay. basically does what I do for technical support. Okay. That's what you think, Stephanie. <laughs> you have no idea what happens at these meetings. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Do we have do we have a quorum on the sixteenth? Um, so right now, technically, you have a quorum, even without you and Andra, and we don't have Lasu. Obviously, I didn't hear from anybody else about their vacation schedule. So right now, as far as I know, you have a quorum, but you know things sometimes change. Stella couldn't make it tonight but um that was like a last minute thing so if something like that happens i don't know and um i believe that there's one more meeting in july correct july 19th i i will be at that meeting and that will be my last meeting is there an effort underway to recruit some additional members um they are aware uh -oh. I I mean, all I can say is they're aware um, that, well, there's always a call. There's always a call for membership. So um, remember, as I've reminded you all before, you're not the only committee and that you're not uh -huh. the only ones with vacancies. So they're trying to do all of these kind of at the same time. I right. know there was a bunch of recent appointments. So hopefully they're, um, you okay. know, they're sort of going through, but I always reach out and say, especially when I, like when I knew that Andra was definitely leaving in August, I sent a reminder and a note um, that that was the case. Okay, so let's make sure we revisit the question of whether we'll have a quorum at the future meetings next time so that we can, if we need to reschedule the meetings so we have a quorum, I would hate to see us, you know, we're gonna be, right? I hate to see us cancel a whole bunch of meetings because we don't have a quorum. I'd rather find a time when we can all be here. There's no real threat right now of you okay. not having the quorums, okay. even with, two members down you still have seven people yeah and that means five need to be present for the quorum jesse are you raising your hand no okay um all right so if there's nothing else for what well what else is on the agenda for next time um pace if we can get don here um And not I much more to say about heat pumps. About solar. I wanted mm -hmm. to talk about the solar out, outreach for solar to. Right. What next for solar promotion I have on my list here. So yeah, a discussion about solar, what we do, what we can do to move that forward. I think we have to talk about town manager goals again. So that's ongoing. And annual report if we need it, but I think it'll be hopefully done. I'll send out something for one last set of comments. And if I don't get any back, I guess we'll just send it in. Okay. All right. If we get the comments back, we might have to discuss it one more time and then we'll submit it after the next meeting. But, um, they get substantial comments. 
All right, so with that, what's the next? Do we have, are we at the public comment yet? Where do yes. we go? So let's open it for public comment. Martha and Eric. Martha, oh, Martha has her hand up. Go ahead. Go ahead, Martha, you can unmute. <laughs> Hello, it's Martha Hanner, an Amherst resident. I'm speaking as an individual, but as you know, I am a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. So I must say, I found all your discussion um, interesting today. And uh, one thing I'm just concerned a little bit, you, you know, sometimes you sound like it's we versus them. And really, we're, we're really honestly trying to do the same thing, right? Right. We're all concerned about the environment and trying to get this right. And so in the bylaw, we have a lot of, you know, sort of the little technical details we have to get right in the draft. And then we have the, the, the bigger issues. And so certainly all the discussion of the maps and, and the issues is, uh, is ongoing. Just had a couple of things to, to say. I see there's a lot of potential in the built environment, like some of you said, you know, you drive around town and you look and you see all these roofs that that really they're sloping and facing south. And why the heck don't they have solar panels on them yet? Uh, but if you got uh, the email from Joe Comerford, uh, I just got it today. You know, she has quite a few bills in progress on the subjects of climate change and solar and so on. I wanted to point out one particular that they just had hearings was called an act promoting solar energy canopies on large parking lots. And she actually referenced an article about a new bylaw in France that's going to require large parking lots all over France to have solar canopies. So, you know, maybe that's our future too, it seems. Uh, that would be helpful. So, uh, then beyond that, I just wanted to, uh, to say to Jesse, you know, appreciated you're going to town council. And it certainly is true. They have so many different subjects that they have to deal with. It's challenging for them to get the knowledge base for every single one, you know, when they have these you know, 6.30 to midnight meetings and so on, and uh, so many different subjects. And so all you can do is just, again, try to be patient and try to feed them the information and talk individually to your individual district representatives who are usually receptive to, to hearing from, from people. Uh, and also a final just comment on uh, the impact of COVID. If you look at the Massachusetts, uh, reports on climate goals and so on, you see that COVID helped the whole state reach their 2020 goals because there's this nice big dip in transportation that happened in 20 to 21, which was the largest chunk of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's because everybody was suddenly working from home. So uh, that is an effect. So you all just keep up the good work. And I do want to assure you that the Solar Bylaw Working Group is, uh, working conscientiously. And we do have a lot of issues still to discuss and then the maps to study, but I think it's interesting that you folks also want to have a good look and discussion uh, of the maps. So thank you, that's it. Thank you, Martha. And thank you for your work on the bylaw working group. Very much appreciated. Okay. Um, did you raise your hand again, Martha? Or is that still? Oh, up? no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. All right. There we go. OK. So if there's no other comment, um, I think we can adjourn. Is there a move to adjourn? Second that. So see you all in two weeks. Thanks, yeah. Laurie. Yeah, we did. Great going, Laurie. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you, Laurie. Thank you. You're all good. All right. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye.